Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. All of our intelligent conversations, our wise conversations, brought to you by our friends at Wise Markets. Also, want to give a shout out to Luke Jones, who's been running around with the Ravens uh, all week. And uh, you can always get the breaking news on the Coons Ford Tech Service. But the uh, Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast, getting us here and there and everywhere. And uh, Chicken Palooza is over, but the chicken's still delicious. Makes a great tailgate, perfect for the game at home, away, take it with you, or whatever. And I don't take in Ravens games without this guy. Everybody uh, sees that I sit with my wife up in Section 513 for 18 years. I've been up in that section since 1998. We sold almost 1,400 PSLs up in those sections of 513, 12, and 14. Don Moeller sat way up top in the beginning. He's way down at the bottom with me the last two decades. Uh, And we have at least kicked off another season where we've got together and we've hooted and hollered and we had a great game. We had a great crowd. And, um, The football part of this and then the baseball part that, you know, you're saying goodbye to that part of the season. It really is an interesting juxtaposition this time of the year for our little recon conversation, is it? Well, well, it is. And, you know, and I'll leave I'll leave the X's and O's and who's playing and who's not playing. We're going to win some. We're going to lose some. I'll leave all that to you and Luke. You do a great job with that. I was more intrigued. A couple things about when we were together at the Kansas City game. And well, they don't play at home again for three weeks, right? So well, like it's a whole Yeah, I right. miss that. I yeah. miss that. But what I was stunned by, and I had I had come off uh, you know, I have the red zone and, and you and I sometimes will text during the red zone. You made a good point that the NFL doesn't survive by fans in the seats. I was struck, including Pittsburgh, when you watch the red zone, and I challenge anyone to do this on a Sunday, the amount of empty seats around the NFL is, is staggering. It, it catches my attention, and I get the economic model that you say that's not <clears throat> what they're counting on. It's not what they do it, which I was fully prepared for 10,000 seats to be empty on Sunday. Because Sunday's hard. It's a night you got to go to work. And Nestor, that place was packed. I mean, there may have been, there may have been 1,500 empty seats, but I don't think there were more than 1,500. And the energy... I, we were talking, the boys and I were talking, you have a much better memory for this stuff. Where was, what was the last home game? Obviously it wasn't last year because we went there, but what was the last home game where you remember that kind of electricity? We were having trouble coming up with it. It would be Flacco, Flacco era and it probably, you know, when we lost so many games, Don, you know what I mean? Like we lost a lot of big home games during all of that era, which is why we wound up playing on the road. We rarely won right. big game. We lost to Cincinnati. We lost to Pittsburgh during those periods of time. We had disappointing finishes. We were the wild card team most of those years well, because we lost <laughs> some of those games. So I remember Tom Brady coming in and it being tough for us. And I remember, uh, you know, some of now now that being said the era and the noise that i heard the the other night i would say um the the chiefs game it was as loud as it's been in oh. this era and and it was boisterous and raucous and it was not that way in the beginning of the game i feel like the end of the game had a crescendo in it in a way that like ray lewis dancing used to in the beginning of the game and so Don, do you remember how much hell was rained down on Peyton Manning the first series yes. when he came in here in oh, 06? Sure. We don't have that anymore because it's not the same people every week. Well, and this goes to my point with you where I turn around and you're behind me. I looked over. All the seats where Bobby Nick sat are Chiefs fans now. Don Scott still sits there. Tom Mars' brother Brandon's above us. I turn around and I, I see a handful of people in the seats behind us that are the original people. Part of that is age. Yeah. You're in your seventies now, you know, sure. like, and part of that is economics or motion in life. I know of five divorces in the section. And, and I, I will say this to you because you weren't there. Um, before we got there very early before the game, I was in my, I seat. would have been, there. you know, I like to be there early. I was panicking. There was an accident on 95 and my guys, we were like, 
Are you kidding me? The first game <laughs> in 18 months. But, man, we booked it up that side street. We made it. But, yes. I had I, a I dear friend of time. mine, uh, Steve Shealy, who sits in our section, who came up to me. And he was alone. And, I'm, and he looked good. He looked you know, healthy. Looked, you know, looked, looked great. And he came down. And I didn't have to ask where his wife was. He said, I lost my wife a year and a half ago uh, to cancer. And, you know, so you you – People have changed in the section. Sure. People have moved around in an area that was like a church. And I'll just say this, Don. I've been doing this a long time. I'm pretty perceptive. Um, I'm pretty semi-famous in certain circles to walk around and have people know me or say hello or whatever. That was a different crowd at the Chiefs game. And yeah, it might have been that, you and me. But, that's but, what I wanted you to talk about. Yeah, because it, it, it didn't it look felt, any – it just looked to me like – Ravens yeah, fans. well, I, I I see things differently, and I know what, areas what, of what tailgates I've walked through. Don, I've walked through downtown for twenty years. I've no, walked no, through no, the tailgate I'm for not twenty arguing years. With you. It was the I'm same asking... people everywhere. Everything's different now, post plague. Crowds well, much what does younger. Does that mean? Um, no, l- listen to my question. I'm trying to zero in. I'm not arguing with you. I know you believe it, which means you're probably right. You're very perceptive. What? Does it mean? And I don't mean that as a challenge. In other words, I look around. Wait, I mean, you, you, you ask me, I mean, what does it mean? Wait I look around and I see 70,000 football fans. And, you know, some of them, a lot of them are drunk, a lot of them are nutty. It's, it's, to me, it's like what I've always seen. You said something looked different. And I want to know, again, it's not I'm trying challenge. to answer this, Don. Oh, okay. Go ahead. What's different? What's different is the people, the human beings. They're 26 years old. They did not see Ray Lewis dance. They're 31 years old. They, they look to me like they got a brand new Lamar Jackson jersey on. These are the fans that need to replace me when I give my tickets up next year. So aren't they these, the these are the people that need to buy season tickets. Okay. That they're now offering, by the way, for $44 on a promotion. Okay. This didn't exist. They were begging me to give them $1,000 for the right to buy the seed. Now they're letting you have a season ticket for $44 a game. So younger people are participating in some way, but I think it's different people. The people that will or will not be, all those Chiefs fans had those seats. Somebody else is going to be in those seats next time. There were 4,000, 5,000 Chiefs fans at the game. Those seats need to be replaced by someone else that's not a Chiefs fan two weeks from now when the, the Chargers come who don't have any fans, the Colts who might have some fans, the the Bengals who used to bring some fans when Marvin ran the place and they were decent, that they need to be replaced. So let's see how the season goes out. Let's see how Lamar plays. Let's have them come back three I, and I one, like all of well, that. What I'm saying to you is when I left the stadium, when I walked out of the press box, I heard a raucous celebration of young people who felt like they had never won a football game. It was, ne- it was never kind of cool. It was kind of fun. It was neat. Oh. But it said to me, I hope they're coming back this year and next year. And for Dick Cass, and he doesn't care because he's got millions of dollars. He, he won't be running the team. Tw- whoever's running the team 10 years from now, coaching the team 10 years from now, selling the season tickets 10 years from now, they're going to need those people in the seats because I'm not going to be there anymore. You might not be there anymore. And that has been the backfill that Dick Cass has talked about for 15 years, yeah, we, were the, we were the anomaly. We were Alabama. Never could get a ticket. Sold out. I got my PSLs. It's church. You show up. You see the same faces. That's changed. And now there's this new thing where kids gamble and they're – they. I saw people at the tailgate, Don. There's no question about this. They came downtown or, or they're there to party outside like pickles. They weren't going into the game. They're, that's a different thing, too, well, that – People that come down to just party. So, so it was a young Sunday night uh, beer, but I didn't see it being like I didn't see people throwing up like in like like that. But I saw people that aren't season ticket holders, aren't PSL holders at a big game, having a great time, spending a lot of money to do it, clearly. And now are they going to come back? And that that's my well, question. on it. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot there to to unpack. Well, you asked me uh, what as I you thought. said, <laughs> as you said, uh, you and I have talked. I've talked personally with Dick Cass a number of times over the years. I think he's totally tapped in to that challenge. I think he does worry about it. As you know, I think he's one of the finest <clears throat> executives in all of sport. 
And I think he focuses like a laser beam on that issue. I agree with you 100%. And then I'm going to segue to, to fantasy. And we will do some politics today, I promise. But all of us, Jeff, Brian, and I commented, I've never heard the crowd as raucous as it was leaving the stadium for any game. So you picked up on that. We looked at it. That was a very, very. That was people celebrating a great time at the stadium for one of the first times in their life. That's what I'm telling you. I have been there for (laughs) all of it. The good days, the bad days, the big wins. I've never seen a championship game. I've been there for awful losses. I've been there for amazing wins, snow games, all of that. Most of those people had never seen anything like what they saw that night. And there, the noise was commensurate with that. That. It well, was one of the more recent experiences for you, but luckily for you, you saw Ray Lewis dance 150 times, yeah. right? These people have no it, – it, Don, let me put it to you this way. How about this? What year was Jeff born? Jeff is a bicentennial baby, 76. 76. Okay. So Jeff in 1983, when – the Orioles won the World Series. You got to see this through the eyes of a seven-year-old who may have known who Brooks Robinson or Boog Powell or Louis. Oh, Lewis I guarantee you he did. It's so, but, but and maybe saw the pictures of McNally jumping or heard your stories of losing your dog at the air, at Friendship Airport. In the he 50s. sure as heck knew how to chant Eddie, Eddie. Okay, fair enough. But it was the first time he got to do it. Everything with the Ravens, all of us experienced for the first time over the first 25 years. We're now getting on to that point where Jeff's going to be going to the games, not with you, but with his kids. Sure. Because they're going to be entering that phase. He might want my tickets, literally, right? He might want the two below and let the kids sit there, and then you can have a family affair. And that's going to be the next 10 years for you. But for a lot of people, it because of price – it's $150. It's $195 that they charge for the ticket next to you for the guy that glared at me funny like I, I didn't belong there, which, again, you know, it speaks to where we are, where I'm in my seat that I've been in for 26 years, and some jackass is looking at me like, what am I doing in the what front row? What, so, so, what do you care how somebody looks no, at No, no, so call, what I'm saying is me, it's boy. not the same people. I was enjoying these games with you. Some of them are dead. Bobby Nick's dead. Lori Shealy's dead. Other people have sold their tickets yeah, well, that's off like, of that's, you know, so that's it's, circle it's, of life. It's, it's, <laughs> no doubt about it. Now it's a new thing. And the new thing isn't the old thing where it's always the same people in the same seats because they were that vested. They need your grandkids to be that vested in a way my kid is. My kid's 37 years old. My kid was not going to spend 300 bucks to be in the upper deck the other night. He's not. That's not what he's going to do. Yeah, no, no, I hear you. I hear you. And I I know people. I mean, it gets in. It's all tied in together. I've I've said to you for a number of years, and and, and I am truly a a dinosaur on this, and, and people laugh out there when he said as you know one of the things i hate hate's a strong word one of the things i'm not a fan of hate hate's not the right word i do not and and you and i agree on this i think people hear us disagree all the time i think something we totally agree i don't get fantasy football at all and i actually think and i know it's led to the red zone which i do love i love the red zone and i know that it's peaked interest among a very different kind of a football fan. I would tell you that in some ways fantasy has really, really been the, uh, the goose and the golden egg story for the NFL in the sense that I, I think it's a strange thing when people aren't rooting for their home team, if they're looking at another game and hoping somebody on a team that we want to lose, they want them to score. Uh, it's, it's just strange. You see and that through your grandkids. Cause they, it's oh, they, they, they all think I'm goofy. They all well, love I mean, people they gamble love on it, too. And I and we've talked at length uh, with Sandy Rosenberg this week about gambling. Right. I talked to John Martin of the Maryland Lottery about, you know, sports gaming and where that is with the lottery and with other things that are going I, on. I really dislike almost close to hate. Again, I'll avoid the term. I really have an issue with the gambling and the way all of the sports franchises have embraced it. I well, mean, it's here to I, stay. I almost lose my mind, and I think I'm pretty easygoing guy. I almost lose my mind when every night 
before the Oriole game as part of pregame. I've got to go do the fan duel thing and what the odds are. And I'm thinking too darn easy for young folks and old folks all across the country to pick up a phone and go and make a bet. It's I, man, I think it's a slippery slope, Nestor. And I think, I think we're going to have a real social cost to pay because of all of this sports betting. I, I hope to be wrong, but I I'm am just not interested in it, you know? So when baseball's trying to hook me in through gambling, they're right. coming at me the wrong way. Baseball hooked me in. You know why baseball hooked me in, Don? And the part that I'm so pissed about through all of this 30 years is the Baltimore thing. You know, the part where it's supposed to matter to the community and be a part of the community. This is where the baseball team's tr been tremendously disappointing through trying to court Washington, take the name off the team, the Orioles, and they're going to come back. Then they're going to fight with Washington for, uh, you know, half of all of your grandchildren's lifetime. They're now in a 15 year war. And it was all about, Baltimore for you over in Catonsville. It was all about Baltimore for me and Dundalk coming through Highland Town and going after Memorial Stadium. It, it's it's their corporate entities now, and um, yeah. And as you know, I'm part able of to... it. The local part of it yeah. is starting to get fractured when the seat next to me is $195 yeah. in the upper deck now, as, right? As you know, <clears throat> I I always separate the corporate part. As I've said to you a million times, it's entertainment to me. And the reason that the Orioles moving forward excite me is that it's good I citizenship think, for me. I think for the first time, as I've said repeatedly on here, there are actually four or five players who actually are bona fide major league players <clears throat> that I believe you can win with. And as as much of a struggle as this has been, I you know, this is weird. The Orioles recently lost a game to the Phillies where they were leading late, and I was like, come on, Phillies. I mean, this is how weird it is. I actually, if, if we could end the season now and, and, and lose the last 11 games, I'd be tickled pink because I want the one, one next year. I want the next Rushman and I want my grandchildren. They got you right where they want you. Man. I want the grandchildren You're for them to lose. It's Stockholm syndrome. I want Don. the, I want the grandchildren to go to a, uh, I know you want to do World some Series. politics. So, I mean, I, you know, I do sports around here. We've done a lot of sports. Well, let's betting. Say, yeah, let's you go at the Baltimore positive because it is, Really top of mind as football season starts and we start a season in Las yeah. Vegas. There's no doubt. Well, about let's that. let's let's do some politics. I mean, really disappointing news the last few days, and boy, I think it's indicative of so much that is happening on the uh, the national scene. When I saw that collapse, that talks had collapsed regarding the ability to get a police reform bill through the United States Congress. I, to me, that was so telling. And let me tell you why, Nestor. That bill that Karen Bass and Cory Booker had worked on for months and months with Republicans led by South Carolina Republican Senator uh, Tim Scott, that, that compromise bill was endorsed by the FOP. But the Republicans... Because they don't want dirty cops in there. They, Repu right? yeah, exactly. But Republicans anymore just purely governed by focus group and the base. And they realize uh, that holding police officers accountable, even though it was supported by the FOP, is not popular with the base. To the point where Tim Scott, and by all accounts, Tim Scott's an admirable guy. He's a conservative African-American Republican. Well, we like some conservative African-American Republicans. We like Michael Steele. We think he's a fine guy. Tim Scott puts out a press release that says the deal fell apart because the Democrats wanted to defund the police. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's not true. So then I went and found an interview with Cory Booker, who immediately points out that there was several hundred million dollars in the compromise <laughs> to supplement police training in communities all over the United States. The defund the police sounds good. The Democrats have never run on defund the police. They've never supported defund the police. The presidential candidate renounced defund the police. But Republicans like the soundbite, and Tim Scott puts it out 
in a press release. The reason I mention all that, I am in a minority among my Democratic friends who I have great respect for that I meet with on a weekly basis. They continue to believe that the Democrats will be able to pass an infrastructure bill and a budget bill. My response to that is in a Congress that couldn't pass the low hanging fruit of police reform without putting out an inflammatory press release on the part of the Republicans, why on earth would I think that the Democrats will be able to pass a reconciliation bill and an infrastructure bill? If they do, then I will say this, several people will have skills beyond what we could ever imagine. And we know at least one does. We know who speaker. Well, it's kind of amazing how the Democrats, Democrats can't get anything done when they're well, controlling things like that, it's because, that. That is the most frustrating part of all of it is that the will of 70, 80 percent of the population on things like Roe versus Wade, on things like guns, yes. on things like that. We can't get an ounce of progress. We're no further along than we were before Sandy Hook than we were before the Mandalay Bay slaughter, like all of these things that have been common sense in places where common sense role, we've gotten well, further and further away from that. Well, yeah. a number of us have said, but Nestor, that's a really, really insightful point. Uh, uh, let me tell you what one of the problems is. There's many, but here's one. A number of us, I think, now agree that it's time for the United States, and there, there's a downside to this, but it's time for the United States to become much more of a parliamentary form of government. And what that means is you'll have left turns, right turns, left turn, right turns, much more frequently than you traditionally would in the United States. And what I mean by that is the way for that to happen is to truly just get rid of the filibuster and recognize that whichever party is in control of 50 seats and 51 if you don't have the White House, so let's say 51 seats if you don't have the White House, will control the United States Senate fully recognizing that the work you've done may be undone by the next Congress. In order for that to work, however, the Democrats need at least two, and there may be others who just are hiding behind Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema. There may be four or five other moderate Dems who don't really want to get rid of the, the, the filibuster. Because remember, as long as the filibuster is there, it even protects some moderate Democrats who have much tougher states and districts who don't really want to bring about some of this progressive change. But well, all yesterday. of this is rooted in how do I keep my job as a politician? Exactly right. Exactly. And that's, that's I mean, there are five percent of politicians probably in the whole country right now who don't need the gig, who were just ran because. The way I would run, which with the way I was going to run for mayor, which is, hey, you want me to run it for a couple of years? I'll run it. I'm not looking to be a lifer politician. That's a different kind of human being that used to serve the country. I know we had your your friend, retired uh, Brigadier General on this week, Donald Shank. Everyone should listen to that piece. But there used to be a sense of service in this, um, not a sense of uh, I'm going to get the lifetime badge and have a gig for life by sticking my finger into the wind and being clever at what bullshit I can feed people on a daily well, basis and get elected three years later. I saw Ted Cruz the other day. I mean, the most disingenuous human right. being I've ever seen. Right. And I guess the, one of the issues with Hogan that, you know, I was sitting with Hogan was, I don't know that I really believed his, his bullshit about the well, voting for Reagan. Like I, I just, I think it was about getting votes that that'll, right. that'll be some raw meat. And I, I just – I'm offended by that as a citizen because I don't think yeah, it's a way to run a government. Yeah, you, you, you and I – I don't want to go back over – you and I disagree. No, but I need, I need Governor to Hogan. know that you're doing this for the right reason. Yeah, I think that Governor Hogan – as I said the, to you before, I think he did that as a protest vote. You can say he should or shouldn't have, but I think he did it as a protest vote. Some a good friend of mine said the other day, evidently Al Franken's back out doing stand-up, and one of his jokes is him. you have to understand – you have to understand that I like Ted Cruz way more 
um, than any other person in the United States Senate. Uh, and I hate Ted Cruz. So <laughs> the point was, there's literally no one. How does that guy get elected? In the United States Senate. Wait, that can what even what be, is the IQ you know, of anyone that would vote for him? Like that, well, it's, I, it's, that's what that, that, or what is in it for you other than you just like that contrary, no, no. you think it's, that that's good for government to have an idiot. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit of that Trumpism and we've talked about it. Who got before. on a plane and left his people right. with his family to run to Cancun? Right. To go dude, to Cancun. Dude should have been... In the old days, he'd have been hung the minute the plane landed. But like see, literally, the people would have gone down and said, "You're not. You're done. You're you're over with." The well, end, it's it's as simple as and whoever thought you could break down politics to a bump, bumper sticker. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the bottom line is, since Ted Cruz, this is where Trumpism is. This is where the Republican Party has devolved. Since Ted Cruz makes people like you and me insane. The base says he's our guy. We don't care about all this other stuff. He makes Moeller and Aparicio and all their Twinkie friends crazy. That's simply what Trump has ta- tapped into. And the issue is. But our country is diminished. Yeah, but see, I don't think. Again, you're thinking you're thinking General Shank. You're thinking on a much bigger service to the nation. And unfortunately, Nestor, that's not what Nestor. I just saw a poll. That unpopular doesn't even begin to describe the Texas abortion law. It seventy percent of the American public. Well, let's disapproves. start with fifty-two percent of them have vaginas. Let's start with right. that. Seventy percent move from, from, and then the other eighteen well, percent are like you, who have a wife you like and a daughter you like well, and grandchildren you like. Yeah, we're talking about includes, the sanctity of. Uh, you, you know, of half of our population's freedom. But that includes, Nestor, 40% of the Republicans. Here's what's happening and what should terrify everyone. And I'm getting ready to write about this. Ken Burns has talked about it recently, noted documentarian. John Meacham has talked about it recently. I do not think that po- folks have fully have a grasp of how fragile our democracy is and truly how much of a balance it is hanging on. And it is clear, I think, to everyone. You had a woman storm the Capitol, cross the line, walk into the Congress, stick her head into uh, and get it, get it shot off. And they've martyred her. Yeah, It didn't, it didn't, did not happen. It was a normal tourist day. And as we sat here and watched it, you, 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 right. you, you talk about teetering in our democracy. Oh, no, it's teetering. We watched and, it January 6th. And here's what's going to happen. I hope. And we, we, now we've seen the paperwork that was written to create the coup. Right. And we're going to allow this as a nation to stand. It's right. It disgusts me. Every well, we've seen we've seen the memos that say to the president and his team, just so you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the voting machines. There's no fraud. The Dominion she- machines work just fine. And they went out. And said the machines were all fixed. So the truth, that's that's my point. And it's not hyperbole. Truth and I know get folks, them elected. folks are raising, rolling their eyes. But here's here's where we are, unfortunately. I think everyone believes that the celebrity president will run again. Uh, he will be nominated. It won't even be close. Nobody's going to challenge him. Uh, other than Liz Cheney and maybe a Kinzinger, most Republicans. Uh, have chosen the, the guy in Ohio just to walk away. So, you know, conservative, rock rib Republican conservatives are just walking away, and they're going to leave the party to a man and his minions who will have us believe that elections no longer matter, that free elections aren't capable of being held in the United States anymore. Well, you know, the Taliban thinks that too. The, yeah, you know, well, the same, it, same philosophy it's of that. It's that terrifying. It's, it's not a sound bite. And you see it particularly in boards of ed. There's a lot being written that the canary in the coal mine is this crazy stuff happening in boards of education all over the country. I had hoped as you had, that when Trump went down, Republicans would have stuck 
a stake in the heart of the vampire and ended it. Instead, Lindsey Graham and others read the tea leaves and said, boy, the base still loves this guy. How so do I though, survive? How do even I though survive, we know he's right? insane. Uh, yes, I'm not willing to put my country ahead of me. That is a wonderful way to say it. And that's what you allude to. Lindsey Graham is smart. He looked at it and he said, I have an option. I can go out as Romney has and tell the truth and tell people as this Liz man Cheney has, as Kim as Liz Cheney has, has. Right. or I can say, I still love the Donald. I love going down there. I mean, Lindsay loves going to Mar-a-Lago and playing golf. And Lindsay chose the trappings and the gold of Mar-a-Lago versus being a true American hero. And as more and more, Master, there was, I love the show, The Circus. Uh, if you don't watch The Circus, you can, it's 30 minutes on Showtime. It's the best. It's irreverent. It's the kind of thing you would like. It's, it's hosted by uh, John Heilman and Alex Wagner, uh, Mark McKinnon. It, it's, it's a terrific show, and it takes a look back at the week in politics. They interviewed a state senator from Florida the other night who's running for Congress, who said the real battle now is within the Republican Party to get rid of liberals like Mitch McConnell and others, liberals like Mitch McConnell and others, and let the party become what it really is, which is the party of people like him, Matt Gates, Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And he said, and we hope that can happen peacefully. The inference being that if it can't, we're ready for armed insurrection. People are saying the truth out loud, Nestor. We better believe them and we better pay attention. And that, my friend, is the recon. He is Don Moeller. He's former Baltimore County executive. We are uh, getting ready for football around here. Luke is out in Owings Mills doing all things purple for you. All, of course, brought to you by Royal Farms Real Fresh, Real Fast. The Planet Fitness has been involved with us for a long time. Victor Brick's going to join us next week. They have a 10-day, uh, uh, the John W. Brick Foundation has a 10-day uh, uh, meetup going on in early October to clear the mind, clear the spirit. Uh, I think we could all use a little bit of that. I'll be telling you a little bit more about that next week. And we've had some great, great guests here at Baltimore Positive all week. You can find all all that we do, uh, our podcast is available anywhere, as well as the website itself. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, anywhere the Ravens are. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. That's the recon, and we are Baltimore Positive.